Welcome to The Read Along. A mini book club for your ears. I'm your host, Scott. I'm your other host, Anita. And join us on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at a time. time. Do you like talking about movies? Do you like talking about mediocre movies? Do you like talking about how you could have fixed mediocre movies? Well, I certainly do, and you can listen to me, Scott C. Bourgeois, along with my co-hosts Greg Beaver and Liam Kreswick, as we give our notes, and I have some notes. You can follow it now on your podcatcher of choice, or support it by visiting patreon.com slash I have some notes. We frequently report on our weekend activities because we generally record early in the week, so it's still top of mind. Mm -hmm. We had an excellent weekend. We did. With the kids. We got a free trip to the zoo. Yeah. Which was nice. Uh, To a private event in the evening at the zoo, too. So it wasn't super hot and it wasn't super busy. Yeah. It was nice. Delightful. uh, All it cost us was some very expensive ice cream. Yes. (laughs) And then we had, like, your company picnic on the weekend as well. Yeah. So was... the kids got to jump around in a bouncy house and eat cookies and popsicles. We did a r- couple errands. We stopped at a toy store so our son could do a little, like, pre-birthday shopping, get some ideas. Yeah, we kind of nerded out for a little while. That was good. Yeah. Just overall, a, a lovely weekend. Yeah, and then Sunday we sat around and did nothing. Well, some of us did. Some of us sat around all day playing video games. While others of us went and ran a couple errands. The point is, it was a lovely weekend. It was a lovely weekend. A little slice of our lives for you, everybody. Yeah. Getting out, starting to enjoy some of the the summer now that it's here. Yeah. And And this coming weekend is going to be Canada Day, so that'll be a big to-do. Yeah, we've we've already got some tentative plans on the go for that. Of course, school gets out this week, so our son is going to be uh, excited for that. Though, I mean, he's still got child care going on in the summer because we don't just get two months off as well but (laughs) i wish but uh yeah he'll have some adventures to look forward to this summer and i'm i'm happy for him yeah it'll be good ah summer at last with summer comes an opportunity to do perhaps a little more reading question mark (laughs) and uh that is definitely something that we did get in a little bit of this weekend and that allows us to recap our previous chapter, chapter 10, in which Rosie has a a very heated conversation with Masha over coffee, uh, in which she learns a little bit of information about exactly how Maxim Brodsky was able to hook up with Meredith uh, the night of the party, and drops a little hint that maybe, maybe Brodsky was mistaken for someone else. A thread that I think maybe even continues into chapter 11 of The Winds Are Not by S.J. Bennett. So we're back at work the next day. Yes. After Rosie's day out doing all this sleuthing on behalf (laughs) of Her Majesty. The Queen kind of arranges things so that Sir Simon is busy that morning so that Rosie can come and talk to her. Mm Mm-hmm. And when Rosie, like, enters the room, the queen is immediately like, oh, I'm very sorry to have heard about your mother. And Rosie's like, my mother's fine. Do you want to hear what my investigation turned up? And the queen is pleased as punch. Oh, I was so delighted that the queen was so delighted to find out that Rosie was, in fact, doing some investigating. That it was all skullduggery. It was smoke and mirrors. And that she herself had fallen for the ruse. Yes. Uh, Well, she hints that she suspected that maybe, maybe Rosie was coming up with an excuse to do some legwork. But wasn't sure. And now she's sure. And more importantly, has a really good feeling about Rosie now. Yeah. She's like, oh, this is this is a good one. This is one I can trust. The queen has this little commentary in her head about all of her past assistants. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm wondering if maybe Rosie isn't in this novel because she is the best assistant Her Majesty will ever have. Well, apparently there was a Mary several, several assistants, assistants back, back <laughs> who was the best. She set the bar high. Um, Not to say that any of the others have been slouches, but Mary, like, she had the real talent for this. She got into it. And the queen is like, maybe Rosie's the next Mary. 
She's shown a lot of initiative. And I'm just saying, Rosie's the one in the novel. Yeah. So I hope so. Indeed. She's proving quite competent so far. I think there's a little impression as well. It amuses the queen to have her assistant personal secretary running around doing this other business for her. <laughs> Probably. Like off the books behind Sir Simon's back. I get the feeling that she, like, it, it amuses her. Yeah. Like this is fun for her. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Like, it's, it's tragic that a man died. Oh, yeah. But there's a mystery to solve, and the mystery is fun for her. <laughs> Especially with the birthday celebration coming down, and Prince Philip off on his little vacation, and just the matters of state. This is a delightful distraction at this time for her. Yes. It came at the right time, even if the circumstances aren't great. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of the impression I'm getting. Tea. Rosie does, of course, have updates uh she fills in the queen on her talks with both meredith and masha yeah she also interviewed the ballerinas yeah uh, briefly there wasn't much new there for her to get one thing just to go slightly back uh that she does mention is that meredith did say that she could uh pass on the uh the details of the affair to the queen but otherwise only the queen she had to keep it in confidence and the queen is like mm, that might prove problematic later on oh yeah and rosie doesn't quite understand what that means and neither do i but... i have a suspicion okay. it's because it's information that the queen can't necessarily now act as openly about because if she can't treat it as evidence? It, it, not as easily. Because if because remember, down the road, when the mystery gets solved, it'll be like it never happened. So if the queen needs to like pass this information along surreptitiously to someone else, but only the queen and the queen's assistant personal secretary are privy to that information, it's very clear where that information came from. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. There's no okay. deniability there. Right. And I think that that's why... That could be potentially sticky later on. Maybe. We'll have to see how that kind of unfurls. Maybe. But, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Uh, but as you say, uh, she did speak to the ballerinas. There wasn't really much new there. No, nothing new that hadn't already passed through the police. Yeah, and the ballerinas weren't really like familiar with Brodsky prior to the event. Yeah, my old ballerina assassin theory from however many chapters ago. <laughs> Not not a thing. Well, slightly less plausible. We'll <laughs> very, very much less plausible, yes. Um, and then she went and spoke with VJ, who is basically Brodsky's roommate. Yeah. And we actually get a, a lot of information about the man himself here that we didn't have prior, just kind of about his day-to-day -day personal life. Yeah, a bit of a character piece, if you will. Yeah. First off, while Maxim was getting some kind of financial assistance from some mysterious benefactor, while he was going through school, apparently when school ended, that dried up. Yeah, whoever it was paid for school, and that was about it. Yeah, and apparently Brodsky was both kind of like relieved that it gave him some freedom and furious that he was no longer getting that financial assistance. And that kind of put him on the back foot financially. He was very lucky to end up with VJ, who apparently knew him from school. They became friends. Yeah. And when they were looking for living arrangements, they just kind of roommate it up. And VJ mostly pays for it. Which is not to say that Maxim was like a freeloader per se. No, no, no. He was your friend who's hard up. Yeah. Like VJ even says, like, he owed me several hundred dollars, but it didn't matter. Yeah, he was good for it. He yeah, would have paid he, me back eventually. Exactly. He yeah. knew the money would have shown up eventually. And it was fine because it wasn't that big of a hit on him. Yeah. Right? So I was saying this to Scott last night before we had sat down to record uh it struck me as a very scott pilgrim and wallace situation <laughs> kind of yeah right where his best friend has money so they're fine except that scott pilgrim was more of a freeloader than scott Maxim pilgrim was, was. <laughs> was more of a an actual freeloader than it sounds like brodsky was yeah because yeah. brodsky was taking odd jobs he was doing piano lessons uh primarily yeah performing here and there as well but generally wasn't just making enough money to support himself fully yeah. And fortunately had a friend who was there to help him help out. Help him out, which is very nice. Um, he was also political. Yes. He had feelings about Russia. Yes. And he did blog about it. He apparently had aspirations to maybe one day be a writer. Maybe. And and do like more, I'm going to say, like investigative nonfiction about this kind of stuff. It's the implication, certainly. Uh, yeah. I don't know that that went very far. No. And I mean, VJ even says like if... Someone's trying to paint Brodsky as something like a hacker. No. 
he did not have no. that much technical acumen. <laughs> well, and he said one of his uh, one of his many jobs, right, mm-hmm. a- aside from teaching music, was that he was teaching computers. Yeah. But the syllabus was from the Dark Ages. Like, yeah. anybody could have taught this. You didn't have to be a computer elite to do that no. job. And apparently Brodsky's knowledge of computers was that level of basic for yeah. the most part. It, it struck me as a little bit uh, Senior Chang from Community. <laughs> Like, someone who is absolutely not qualified to teach what they're teaching is teaching what they're teaching because the school doesn't care. Well, qualified enough, and he was willing to do the job. But basically what VJ is painting here is a person who's not, like, some sort of white hat hacker, which is kind of what MI5 was alluding to him being. Right? But I think he's... MI5 was... Uh... Jumping to conclusions and making some strong assumptions. Yeah, because Brodsky wasn't that computer literate. He ran a blog. And you don't need to be that computer literate to have a blog. With all due respect, he just sounded like an angry man putting his opinions on the internet. Yeah. And there are a lot of those. All and it really does seem unlikely that that background noise that he was making would have cut through to really anger anybody in the establishment in Russia. Yeah, exactly. The other thing that we learn about Brodsky is that he went through a bit of a, I don't, I don't want to necessarily say messy breakup, but like a heart-wrenching breakup recently. Yeah, I don't know if it was messy, but it was, yeah. It was bad because it left him heartbroken enough that for several months now, he's been single and he's been brushing off other advancements. Um, apparently... This is a guy who does have girls kind of throwing themselves at him. Well, he's young, he's, he's handsome, he's talented. He's a talented musician. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there have been like lady callers, but he's been, according to VJ, kind of like politely brushing them off for the last couple months because he's been working through this breakup. Yeah. And I get the impression that he doesn't want to rebound with someone and then like leave them heartbroken because it didn't mean anything. Well, like VJ says, he's he's genuinely uh, like a good guy. Yeah. A nice guy who doesn't want all of these flings. And this tracks to me with why he then was interested in hooking up with Meredith. Because he was at this party. He was swept up in the moment. He had this... Same as she was, right? Yeah, intensely passionate, like, moment with her. And I feel like in his mind, he knew, oh, this isn't going to go anywhere. This is definitely a one-night stand. And I could absolutely use that right now. Yeah. Like, uh... Meredith was, was the rebound fling that he needed. And so he was ready to jump on it. And Masha even said in the previous chapter, he came across as somewhat desperate to do it. Yeah, he was laughing and desperate. Yeah. So, like, I feel like that was where his headspace was in that moment. Like, this is happening. I'm going to do this. I want to do this. Is it crude to say that, like, you know, blow off a little steam, you know? And if it had been a few months, maybe he needed that right then. Right? Right. And again, we already talked about this, like, magical fairy tale of a night. Right? Yeah. Maybe he, just the same as Meredith, maybe he just gave in to that moment and went with it. I am in a castle dancing with a beautiful woman. This is insane. Is, Let's is go old, with this. Who's old enough to be my mom, so is clearly not interested in, like, a relationship. Yeah. But is sending me signals that she might be, like, ready to have some bedroom time right now, if you catch my <laughs> meaning. So, yeah, like, I can I can understand, like, this tracks to me, basically, is what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, the information about the ba- breakup, the information about him brushing off lady callers, and then that leading to him hooking up with Meredith, that makes perfect A to B sense in my brain. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about this little character piece on Maxim Brodsky is that he genuinely doesn't seem like a guy with too many skeletons in his closet. No. The few skeletons that MI5 was able to dig up all seem with further context to be pretty innocuous right his blog his financial like assistance and so it seems more and more like there doesn't appear to be a clear motive why he would be targeted for murder the queen even says as much she's like so the motive is here yeah right meaning it had to have something to do with that night it had to have something to do with that night or as i postulated last chapter right It was a case of mistaken identity because someone thought he was Yuri's servant, Vadim. Or or even somebody else. But it seems more likely that Vadim was the target. Which leads me back to the thought, like, what could be the motive for targeting Vadim? That I don't know. And the best I can come up with is somebody wanted to hurt Yuri. Maybe. And so went after his manservant. Because he couldn't strike at Yuri directly, but he could strike at Yuri adjacently. Yeah? 
But that's literally the best I can come up with at the moment. Right. But that doesn't entirely track either because then why would you make it look like a suicide? If you're trying to send a message, but why cover it up? But you have to also remember the nature of the suicide. It wasn't a suicide. It was an accident that involved a very salacious situation. No, and that's what I mean. It's the same problem again, though. Why make it look like a like an accidental suicide? I don't know that it's necessarily someone trying to send a message to Yuri. Again, the best I could come up with was that someone was trying to hurt Yuri. And what better way to hurt a man than to have a person who's his most trusted aide get caught in a scandal, a huge scandal. His manservant having done something salacious at Windsor Castle as a guest of the Queen? That's potentially damaging. I'm just thinking outside of the box here trying to come up with any motive why. Which is fair, but in more than one way, that plan then utterly failed. Because A, they would have gotten the wrong person. Which they uh, did if that was the case. And B... It wasn't a huge scandal. They Because they kept it quiet and because it didn't appear to be a person affiliated with Yuri. Right. And it very quickly became obvious that it was not an accident because there was yeah, but, proof that it was murder. Yeah, but then that news didn't get out. No, they, they kept it quiet because they didn't want the scandal to affect the royal family. Right. Again, so much went wrong, (laughs) if that is the case. Yes, if that is the case. But that also then points back to it not being a professional hit. That's true. I would argue you would need a professional, though, if you're going to be inside Windsor Castle. But maybe not. But maybe not. But more than that, like, it could also have been a spur-of-the-moment thing. Someone had reason to want to strike at Yuri that night, mistook Brodsky for Vadim. Yeah. And went after Brodsky. Just as likely as someone was angry at Maxim Brodsky that night, for whatever reason. For whatever reason. And decided to murder him in that moment. That's kind of what we're pointing at here, because even, as you said, the Queen even said, like, the motive must be here at the castle. There doesn't seem to be any reason why someone would have planned long term to kill him. Right. This very much seems like it must have been a crime of passion. Yeah, there is clearly, clearly a connection somewhere that we don't know about. Yeah, but we're still turning up clues. Of course we are. We're still in early chapters. And more importantly, we know that Rosie has been given a new task, but we don't know what. Because the queen's like, okay, if Rosie's good for this, I'm going to give you a slightly more weird request. Hear me out. And that's kind of where the chapter ends. Yeah, so I don't know what Rosie's up to next. I assume something fun. Probably more sleuthing. Probably. Yeah. Good times. Turn up some more evidence, find some more stories. Yeah, and that's where we end for this week. Yeah. I got nothing else. Neither do I. So I guess that's where we'll wrap up. Yeah, so that's where we'll stop. I'm just going to sit here and wait for more info to come at me. And then hopefully we'll be able to get a clearer picture of the puzzle that we're putting together. Yeah. So you'll want to read up on chapter 12 in time for next week. Uh, In the meantime, of course, as always, you can give us a little rating and a review on your podcatcher of choice because that helps us out. Absolutely, it does. And we appreciate it. We do. Uh, We like to share appreciation via social media. Absolutely. Send your digital appreciations over uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads. We are at the read along on most of those. You can find us there. Yeah, you can also send us an email. Absolutely. We are the read along at gmail.com. And with that said, as always, we love you very much and we'll see you next time. Mystery Mysteries. Thank you for joining us on The Read Along with your hosts, Anita and Scott Bourgeois. All Read Along music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cover art is by Aaron Beaver. Be sure to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Read Along, and check out our group on Goodreads.com. Thank you.